much. We're going to go ahead and get our panel started today. Uh, again, my name is Lisa Zielinski, and I am with the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. So today we have our open data panel, and moderating our panel today is Keith Webster, the Dean of the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. And with that, I'm actually just going to turn it right over to him. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon. Uh, <coughs> those of you sitting at the back will probably learn fairly quickly that my voice has a habit of going quiet, so I can either keep on shouting or you can move closer to the front, and it's your choice, but if I do fade away, either wave your hand or move. Uh, delighted to welcome our panelists, who are all leaders in the open data movement in Pittsburgh and beyond, and they represent an array of disciplines from humanities and social sciences to engineering and the natural sciences. Uh, Properly sourced and curated, open data arising from scholarly endeavor represents a tremendous resource for the research community. And if we get our job right today, that resource can exist for many generations to come. Broadly speaking, and I'll repeat that invitation to go to the CFA building on the CMU main campus at 6.30 to learn more about it. But open data, from my simplistic perspective, data that anyone can access, use, and share, and has a license permitting those activities. Good open data can be linked to so that it can be easily shared, talked about, and is available in standard and structured format so that others can rely on its traceability right back to where it originates, can determine whether it's trustworthy, and can enhance scholarship into the future. Our four speakers are going to share some of their innovative approaches to create data, to make it openly accessible, and of the infrastructure requirements they need during their research activity and beyond. I'm going to introduce each of the speakers, one after the other, and then invite them in turn to say a few words about their activity. We may deviate, it's going to be a very informal, light-hearted event. There's lots of food, there is a bar over there, don't wait till 5.30 to top up. Just get up, move around. Let's just, <laughs> we'll do the same thing. Uh, those of you who were at the uh, peer review panel discussion last Monday will have seen some cookies provided by our hosts at the University of Pittsburgh with the open access logo. I'm not sure how they did theirs, but ours have been prepared by Lisa and Anne-Marie using proper proprietary open access with cookie cutters, <laughs> which were printed on the 3D printers in the Hunt Library yesterday. I think. And they are solid things, so 3D printing is sustainable. <laughs> the cookies are there. The code to make your own printouts also is available. So if you really have the urge, you can make those cookie cutters. So to our panel, and I'll start with Mario, who is closest to me. So Mario Berger is an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He's interested in making our built environment more operationally efficient and robust through the use of information and communication technologies so that it can better deal with future resource constraints in a changing environment. He's the faculty co-director of the IBM Smart Infrastructure Analytics Lab at CMU as well as the director of the Intelligent Infrastructure Research Lab. He's received numerous awards, um, including the Dean's Art Career Fellowship from CMU earlier this year. He received his BSc in his native Dominican Republic and his master's and doctoral degrees from Carnegie Mellon. Sitting next to Mario is Christopher Warren, an associate professor of English at Carnegie Mellon where he teaches courses on Shakespeare and early modern culture. His research interests include digital humanities, law, literature, political theory, early modern literature, global studies, and the history of political thought. His first book, Literature and the Law of Nations, 1580 to 1680, was published earlier this year by Oxford University Press and is a literary history of international law in the age of Shakespeare, Milton, and Hall. A uh, digital humanities project he founded with Daniel Shore, The Six Degrees of Francis Bacon, aims to be the broadest, most accessible source of who knew whom in early modern Britain. 
the beta site was released earlier this year. Um, it was featured on Gizmodo today, I believe. Um, Chris will tell you much more about it. He did, in, in his background notes, tell me that it's been featured in a variety of um, erudite scholarly journals such as the Smithsonian Magazine, Mental Floss, and for the various Brits around the world, looking at you for the reaction. It has also been featured in the Daily Mail, and you can derive from that what you wish. Um, but we are very proud of you. Uh, next to Chris is Jeff Hutchison, an associate professor in the chemistry department at Pitt. His research is in materials chemistry, particularly rapid screening of molecules and polymer, polymers for engineering, so for energy applications. But Jeff is here because he was involved in starting the Pitt Quantum Repository, which can be used for teaching and research, and is the first database that easily allows students to view 3D molecules on their phone. They've computed properties of over 100,000 molecules using quantum chemical methods. And they've also developed the open source chemistry program Avogadro, used by half a million people in 20 languages for a variety of do-it-yourself quantum calculations. Jeff also pointed to the CMU connection in that Professor John Popola, a former CMU faculty member, <coughs> had a long-term vision of a global quantum chemistry database. And even closer to home for me is the fact that John Popel was a Nobel laureate and his Nobel medal is on display just outside my office. And Bob Greta is the fourth member of our panel. He manages the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center at Pitt's University Center for Urban and Social Research. Bob provides overall project management to the data center and also takes the lead in building relationships with data publishers and users. He also is responsible for community engagement efforts, and we've discovered a shared passion for being brutal about the traffic in and around the part of Pittsburgh where we both live. So if you fancy speeding along Forbes Avenue, you've got us to deal with. <laughs> so I am going to turn it over to our panelists and invite Mario to start with some opening remarks. Sure. Um, so I think I mean, you, you well uh, put some of the background information about who I am and what I do at CMU, but I'd like to maybe start with uh, more of an anecdote of how I got involved in open data and use that as maybe a starting point so that if you have questions later, you can refer back to that. Um, so my quest, uh, I don't know if I would put it as strongly as a quest, but my uh, work on open data started because when I was a master's student here, uh, I was faced with a question that led to my PhD and is still ongoing, uh, and it's a question about data. Um, somebody, uh, actually there was an energy uh, SAR at CMU, that's the actual title, an energy SAR, a person who was in charge of managing energy uh, for all buildings on campus. He came to us, to the masses in, in, a group, in uh, the group that I was in and said, uh, we have a problem here at CMU where uh, we only receive a single monthly bill for all our utilities and we don't know where we're spending energy, which building is spending more, which building is spending less, who should we charge, is it the Dean of Engineering, is it the Dean of Arts, we don't know. So we took that uh, as a question that we thought could be answered by just uh, measuring. We thought that data could be accessed very easily. And uh, as master students we went on and uh, acquired some instruments and started deploying them around campus to measure electricity consumption at the finest resolution we could find. Um, and that actually eventually led to a conclusion that it is pretty impossible, it's kind of impossible to measure exactly how much energy you're consuming and know how you're consuming it. And I'll give you one example. Uh, so right now, you have a single monthly bill, but if I give you information about how much electricity you're consuming, let's say in real time, um, not just monthly, but just in real time, would you be able to make better decisions? So this per particular second, you're consuming a thousand watts. Next second, 1,050. Next second, 1,100. You don't know what to do with that information. So that data alone wasn't enough, and we started a whole project to figure out if we can translate that those measurements into useful information. So if we saw a jump of 50 watts in your house, we knew that was exactly a TV, and it couldn't be some other things, because we know that TVs jump about 50 watts, and that's 
started to build patterns that we could uh, teach computers to then recognize what was happening in your house and build fingerprints for individual appliances and let computers uh, deal with understanding exactly how much you're consuming wood and real appliance. And that led to my PhD uh, thesis and everything else. But uh, to solve that question, uh, we need a lot of data. So we don't know what these patterns are, what they look like, and uh, there's no published information about that. So we started a quest uh, to gather all that information, and uh, that led to publication from my team and from people around the world on measurements of energy consumption that is uh, annotated and well curated so that people can then use all that data to train models and you know, solve the problem. So I'll stop there, but that's kind of how we got started. Thanks. So, um, as uh, I think the only human is on the panel, um, I, I should probably explain that um, data is not a word that comes naturally to me. In fact, <laughs> uh, um, it's only uh, in the last few years, uh, coincident with being at Carnegie Mellon, that I have even sort of thought of myself as being involved in data. Um, and I also sort of want to talk about um, how that story and how that happened. Um, Six Degrees of Francis Bacon is, is, the, um, is a project that um, sort of reconstructs historical social networks, specifically those uh, of people who were alive between 1500 and 1700. Um, and sort of, uh, you know, early on in the kind of genesis of the project, my collaborators and I thought this was, would be a good idea. But we thought we would go about it in a very traditional humanistic way, which is to say we would look at um, manuscripts and lists and books and write things down and um, sort of, you know, turn them into some kind of computer digital artifact, but data was never really part of that sort of conceptualization. Um, but this is a very sort of CMU story. Um, there was, a, there was a colleague who was hired at CMU in, in, when I was in 2010 in the statistics department, and we were sort of walking down the hall. We share a hall in Baker Hall at CMU. Um, and said, hey, do you want to get lunch sometime? Sure, what are you working on? I'm working on this. What are you working on? Um, I, you know, I'm thinking about reconstructing historical social networks. And this colleague in statistics said, actually, there are some fascinating statistical problems there. And I was blown away. You know, I was I was blown away. Like, why would statisticians care about historical social network? You know, I, I care about care about great works of art, great works of literature, where people get their ideas, their language. Um, that this is a statistical issue was was just kind of incredible to me. Um, and so, uh, ultimately, we sort of um, had a series of conversations in which. Um, one of his, his uh, PhD students, at that time the master's student, sort of worked with us a little bit to sort of identify sources of what I soon learned to call unstructured data, and to, uh, you know, which, which, which I used to call books. <laughs> um, uh, right? and, and so to sort of identify sources of unstructured data um, to uh, infer social networks from, from these um, sources. Um, and then, and then, sort of over time, we, we sort of um, developed sort of working ways to to um, uh, visualize that data and manipulate that data and learn more and more about the way people were connected in history. Um, and uh, over time, I have um, been convinced uh, about the sort of need for open access in in a couple different ways. One way is that when you think about the sources of unstructured data from which you reconstruct historical social networks, um, one of the kind of key sources for us has been stuff that's already digital, in digital form, ideally HTML or text files, mostly secondary scholarship. A lot of the secondary scholarship is in the public domain, but that's everything published prior to 1923. Um, what that means is that if you're reconstructing social networks from texts published before 1923, you are effectively uh, re reconstructing the biases and omissions um, of the Victorian period, basically. Um, and so there's a whole kind of century of knowledge, more or less, that um, has to be omitted. So um, you know, we've been we've been sort of looking at more and more ways to kind of work with uh, works that are in copyright in order to actually have an accurate picture of who knew whom in this period. Um, and the second, the second um, sort of commitment to open data has to do with what we do with our sort of document matrices and our, um, 
the probability uh, matrices that we developed. Um, you know, if you go to our website right now, sixdegreesoffrancisbacon.com, you can download, um, you know, all of our data for free and manipulate it and, you know, do what you want with it. Um, that's, that's very much a kind of commitment to um, the recognition that there are a lot of things one could do with this. We do some interesting things with it, I think, um, but we don't have a sort of monopoly on what you might learn from this data. Um, you know, it's really exciting to me to think about um, combining this data set with data sets from earlier periods and later periods and be able to kind of say um, how have social networks changed over time from 1500 to 1800 or from 1500 to 2000. Um, that's a sort of possibility that's only possible if data is open and accessible um, and that other researchers who are sort of asking sort of parallel or constant questions can um, use that data. And so we want to sort of put it out there um, and very much the hope is that uh, over time we're going to have, you know, um, a really um, rich world of um, new knowledge developed because um, historians, literary scholars, um, historians of science, art historians are um, thinking about the past in new ways and learning to uh, see how data can help um, answer questions that are important to humanity. So, um, I'll actually start with a historical side to this, right? So, modern scientific method, scientific thought really began in the Enlightenment. Uh, before that, and particularly in chemistry, right, you had alchemists. And when they came up with the discovery, they really did not tell anyone, right? They'd write things in various codes. They might not even tell their apprentices. Uh, and, you know, what transformed science was the Royal Society and starting to publish scientific discovery and philosophical transactions and other uh, scientific journals. And the transition occurred, right, in uh, earlier science and mathematics, you'd keep these ideas secret to protect your job uh, to a transition where you'd say, okay, I am going to tell you all the details so that you can reproduce my discovery. That's how you trust me and I'm going to publish it, and then I'm going to get impact for that. And, right, the, the fact that we've got hundreds and thousands of scientific journals, right, speaks to the uh, massive success of that. The question that now, right, as we move into a digital realm, uh, the, let's call it the cheminformatics, right? And that's something I'm actually involved in. How do you process chemical data in new ways to, to build networks and allow others to build on uh, the raw data files? So when I was a graduate student, uh, I went to Northwestern and uh, John Coble, after he left CFU, went to Northwestern and, and gave a presentation. He talked about this idea of a global quantum database. It started because uh, when Coble began in the, the 70s doing these quantum calculations, they're extremely time consuming. They still are, right? The, the methods, Moore's law is wonderful, but people advance new methods that are more and more uh, uh, computationally intensive. And um, so he had this idea, look, why should, why should everyone repeat a calculation of the, the properties of benzene, right? Um, someone should do it once and then publish it in some electronic format that others can um, can access, right? And then, um, you know, maybe you do you change things, but you can build on it. Um, <coughs> the problem, of course, is that a lot of uh, chemical software, quantum chemistry methods, are sold. And um, the company that John Popel uh, created out of CMU um, actually um, saw this as a threat to their bottom line, right? Because if you uh, are publishing the results of all the calculations, then you don't need a license to the software program to run the calculations. Um, so, uh, I was really inspired by uh, that presentation that, that Pope gave and um, thought, well, look, you know, I, I, I've taken plenty of computer science classes. Uh, my father had uh, done work with computer science and, um, in databases, real time databases, and so on. Um, this just sounds like a database problem, right? It's not like a solving problem. But as a grad student, it sort of sat on the shelf. And, uh, when I came to Pitt, um, it was something I was interested in, and uh, people said, well, you know, start doing that after tenure. I said, okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, I was still interested, um, as, as you said, right, uh, my group developed this package called Avogadro. It, uh, it's a user-friendly way on the desktop to uh, draw molecules and, and run simulations. Uh, I, I designed this software so that I could take 
undergrads and even high school students and get them uh, to do this kind of research. Um, but the question in Avogadro is, again, the question that John Popel had. Well, okay, so I draw out this molecule. Um, you know, if someone's already done a calculation on it, should I be able to click a button and have it just import the data? Um, why should I have to uh, do the calculation again? Um, it, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, it's, you know, in 2015. Um, and a colleague came to, my, to me and he said, hey, I've got this great idea uh, for education. I said, look, when we teach chemistry, one of the significant problems in teaching chemistry, we draw things in two dimensions, on paper, on a blackboard, in a textbook. But molecules live as 3D objects. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a key skill for chemists to be able to take that 2D depiction and then think about in 3D. And, um, some people do better at this. It's a, it's a learned skill. And he said, look, every student we have in chemistry class, um, they all have smartphones. Um, and we're basically telling them, turn off the smartphone. We don't want them to use it. Um, that seems silly, right? This smartphone is at least as powerful. Uh, it's probably thousands of times more powerful than you know, the computers John Popel was running calculations on uh, in the 70s. Um, and they've got cameras. So hey, let's put a little uh, QR barcode or a URL on the slide. And uh, they zap the QR code. It takes them to a web page. There they've got the 3D view of the molecule. And I said, oh, this is perfect. You just figured out the access way. Uh, but what you need for your method to work is you need a database. You want hundreds of thousands, millions of the most interesting molecules, right? So uh, someone wants to lecture about aspirin. Um, they, they don't need to go fetch the structure of aspirin, right? It's there at their fingertips. And so Daniel and I uh, wrote a proposal, and the Dreyfus Foundation uh, funded it. Uh, and that was the genesis of PQR, right? And so on a smartphone, or uh, if I actually have net access on an iPad, uh, right, I can come in, and uh, lo and behold, right, here's, here's molecules, and I can move them around on my, on my screens as three-dimensional objects. Uh, and we said, look, this is a great opportunity. So each record in the PQR has a separate, citable digital object identifier, DUI. Um, we worked with some people in the Pitt uh, library who hooked us up with ways we can mint um, a few million DOIs uh, without breaking the bank. Um, and um, we've set them up as, as living data structures, right? Because we ex fully expect people to build on them. Uh, and we just see that as a continuation the scientific method in the 21st century. Come up. Uh, anybody come up with any good panelist drinking games? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that maybe I could write a word on here and not let any of the other panelists see it. <laughs> if anybody wants me to do that, I think. Um, so I come at it maybe from a little bit of a different perspective. I'm out in the community and I'm working with data and I have been for a long time. Uh, so I've been at Pitt for six years, and before that, spent 10 years at Heinz at Carnegie Mellon. And pretty much that whole time, I've been helping people either find and use information uh, about communities in, in southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, so about 10 years ago or so, um, collaborated when I was at CMU with, with folks where I work now at Uxer to create this uh, project called Pittsburgh Neighborhood Community Information System. Anybody heard of it? Oh, wow, it's surprising anybody has. Um, but really, it was our, our goal to try to unlock data from government. This is pre-open data. Um, we were working with a lot of community organizations. I have a city planning background. So we would get calls from faculty members or community nonprofits working in the middle of Homewood trying to understand, like, you know, who owns this property that we're looking at, or is it vacant, because we can't really tell, or, um, you know, are the owners paying the property taxes? So those were all important questions to community development, and we really couldn't answer it unless we had a systematic way to actually get the data out of government and put it together and then share it out with people. And, and so it's, it was a very manual project. It was like me going to meetings and saying, you know, hey, can I have this data? This is what you want to do with it. And you can trust me because I'm from the university. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't have the most robust infrastructure. And then once we started to build the relationships within government, everybody was great. Um, but we realized the capacity wasn't there. So people would email me attachments to uh, an Excel file or a CSV file, 
the data was a, just a giant mess, and I tried with my like rudimentary data skills to clean it up. And we did that for a few years. I throw it on a GIS server whenever I got the time to update a new data set. It was not at all timely, but people were pretty appreciative because it was really hard to get data, and it still is in, in so many ways. But um, you know, through that work, we became part of this national community. The um, Urban Institute has a program, National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, and it's a network of 30 plus cities that really do what we do. We're data intermediaries in the community. Uh, we help people out outside of academia or even within academia find and use information about their communities. Um, and, and so what we're trying to do with the new project that I manage, the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center, is take that role of being that intermediary, helping people with data, and then connect it to uh, an infrastructure around open data. And you know, because we didn't have the legal infrastructure, you know, we had people sign a waiver saying, I'm not going to hold a responsible University of Pittsburgh if you do something with the data. Um, we didn't have any other infrastructure other than that. We didn't have a technological infrastructure other than the GIS server. So it was really hard to really do anything at scale. So after a while, I kind of got a little frustrated with wanting to do more and not having the skills to do it. So I kind of sat down with people that we knew at the city and talked to people in other cities and just kind of watched what was going on with open data because it's good to be a last mover in a lot of cases. Um, and, and just some of the observations that we had and, and I'll try to get into what we're doing through some of the moderated questions that um, Keith is going to have. But the yeah, demand for data is growing. It's you know more and more apparent that people want to use information to solve problems. And in a lot of cases, it's even harder for people um, to find and use that information. The more the more data that's out there, it's, just, it's a real problem. You know, what do I use? Tell me what's important. So those are the kind of things that we try to answer. Um, People also don't want to really go to a website and play with the interface and use the built-in visualization to get data. Um, our old website, you had to use the um, map to make your own maps. You couldn't really change the colors on the points and things like that. You can only download records a couple thousand at a time. Um, so people want to use data on their own terms. So they just want to, they just want it all at once. Download it. API is great if they're going to build a tool, but um, you got to give it to them so they can pull it into Tableau or pull it into something else that they want to use. So don't really kind of um, create problems encumbering them with any tools that they don't want to make, they don't want to touch. Um, so that's another lesson we learned. We also learned, I think this is another lesson that's pretty easy from the story I told, data owners, especially those in the public sector, really don't know how to publish data well. Um, they don't know how to manage it well. And I think there's an opportunity there in what we're doing to, to really encourage them to document their data, improve the quality of it, through community process and feedback, um, and, and those kind of things. So we're really enthusiastic about the response that we're getting from the city and the county, our partners on this project. Um, people also want fresh data, not stale. For me, it was really hard for me to update some data sets that were real pain in the ass. Um, more, than every, more than once or twice a year, it was just like too painful. I didn't have the funding to really go and hire anybody to do it. I was kind of doing it pro bono. Um, and, and so, you know, you can see the importance of have not having fresh data. I'm like, yeah, if we could, we could only get you this updated list of property owners every month, then you could actually track who owns the, you know, who owns or which investor that's a real problem in the county is buying properties and target them every month. Um, so one of the goals we're trying to do is actually encourage routine automated publishing of data. Um, we also learn people don't talk to each other about data. You know, people, we would learn about things and then we tell other people about things that other people were doing with data that were pretty cool. But those people weren't talking to each other, and there was no institutional framework that enabled that to happen. And we're hoping to do some things around that, too. Um, two more. Um, Infrastructure is an afterthought. People just thought about data for their own project, and they didn't think about it, each other, how other people needed to use the data. And so we're trying to bring an infrastructure perspective to what we do. And it's not just about solving problems, but it's about helping other people solve problems while you solve your own problems. And then the final piece that um, we learned from our, less, our, our last 10 years of work were, was that problems cross borders. You've got so many issues here, whether it's um, wastewater issues, um, vacant abandoned properties, that you know we've got 130 municipalities in this county, 42 school districts, one county government, how many police forces, I don't know. And then if you go outside of that, you've got even more governments. And you've got regional levels of government. You've got authorities. And if you're trying to just solve 